Now we continue with the analysis of LDPC codes and we use a different tool now to do the analysis, which is the so-called exit chart. And the exit chart is a very valuable tool because we will use it later to optimize LDPC codes because it's a tool that is very well suited for optimization. So what is an exit chart? And for uh, introducing the exit chart, we essentially start from the fixed point equation, respectively from the iterative update equation. So we have the fixed point equation and we analyze the behavior of LDPC codes based on this fixed point equation, which is f of epsilon xi, that's this function, equals xi. So if we have a fixed point that is different from zero, it means decoding gets stuck and we cannot converge. So we wanted to know when we can convert. So now we analyzed this fixed point and uh, we can also decompose this function as two functions. So we have one part of this function that describes the action of the variable nodes. That's the function v tilde. And that is epsilon times xi to the power dv minus one. That is the influence of the variable nodes of this to this update equation. And then we have a check node update equation that is um, c tilde of xi, which is one minus one minus xi to the power dc minus one. That is the action of the check nodes. And we can say that f of epsilon xi is equal to v tilde that is parameterized with epsilon of c of xi. So we just compose the two function v tilde and c tilde and obtain the function f epsilon xi. So when do we have convergence? We have convergence if there is no fixed point, meaning if f of epsilon xi is always smaller than xi. This means in each iteration or in this specific iteration, we will converge downward. So we will decrease the error probability. This should hold for every xi between zero and one. That is the fixed point condition. And then we can write this as equivalent. So we just insert this expression. So this is v tilde of epsilon of v tilde of xi should be smaller than xi. And now what we do is we separate this composed function into a variable node part and a check node. So we take v or we take the inverse of v tilde epsilon on both sides. And then we have the condition saying that c tilde of xi must be smaller than v tilde minus one of xi parameters by epsilon. So this is an equivalent condition for convergence. This should hold for any c between zero and one. So this is something that we can now visualize. So what we're going to do now is we do a graph and we plot the two functions. We plot this function c tilde of c, function of c, and we plot the function v tilde epsilon minus one of c. And if v tilde minus one of xi is strictly larger than v tilde of, uh, than c tilde of xi, we have convergence. So let's do this. This is what we have. So we plot v tilde minus one and c tilde of xi in a single diagram. This is what is shown here. And then we, um, what we do then is we start with c tilde and now we plot v tilde for several values of epsilon. So we plot v tilde minus one epsilon equals 
0 0.3. Uh, we can plot it for uh, epsilon equals 0 0.4292. Recall this is epsilon star, this is the threshold. And we can plot it for v tilde minus 1 of 0 0.5. Recall plotting v tilde minus 1 means plotting with flipped axis. So we plot v, but we use the x axis or we use the y axis as equivalent x axis. So this is what we get, and we see, let's go back a slide, for um, epsilon equals 0 0.3, we see that V tilde minus 1 of 0 0.3 is larger than C tilde, and this means we have convergence. So this function is always above. We also say there is an open decoding tunnel. Then we, um, for um, epsilon equals 0 0.4292, we see that the curve is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit above. And we also have convergence because of an open decoding tunnel. Now, for epsilon equals 0 0.5, we see that the two curves cross, and we have an area where the condition is violated. So here, actually, C tilde of C is larger than v tilde minus 1 of 0 0.5 of c and this violates the condition so we have no convergence so essentially decoding is possible if there is an open tunnel between the two curves and we can also get an immediate insight into the number of required iterations why is that well, we can visualize decoding very easily. So we start, let's do this example. We start with c is equal to 1. Then we have the action of the variable nodes. Variable nodes essentially determine chi 0. So this is chi. Then we go to the check nodes again. We have the action of the check nodes. Then we have the action of the variable nodes. Then we have the action of the check nodes, the action of the variable nodes, check nodes, variable nodes of the check nodes, and so on. So we see that after, in this case, one, one, two, three, four, five, six iterations, we have converged. And this is because the decoding behavior can be visualized as a kind of a staircase. So we have always, we start at this point one, one, then we move to the variable node curve, then we execute the check nodes, then we execute the variable nodes, we execute the check nodes, and so on. So decoding can behave as a, uh, decoding behavior can be visualized using this staircase function. That is very nice. Okay, so um, here is a, the example. So decoding starts at the upper right corner and one decoding iteration corresponds to one step of the staircase. And here we require nine iterations to reach error-free decoding. Okay, so this is the essentially the exit chart. Um, the exit chart can be formalized a little bit. Um, we're just going to formally introduce it because what we did here um, can be later extended to other channels as the binary erasure channel. And therefore, we introduce a little bit of formalism because in other channels, we don't have an erasure probability. We need to have some other measure. This other measure is a measure we know from information theory. It's the mutual information. So let's take a look at uh, how we can formalize this a little bit. First, we define something that is called an extrinsic vector. So an extrinsic vector is essentially a vector where we remove one component. So for instance, uh, if we have a received vector y, then the extrinsic vector y tilde i is essentially the vector where we remove position yi. So it's y1, y2, up to yi minus 1. Then we continue yi plus 1 up to yn. So the vector y tilde i 
is essentially the vector y excluding the value at position. So here we have a couple of examples. y tilde 1 is the vector y2 to y7. y tilde 2 is the vector y1, y3 up to y7, and so on. So that is what we call an extrinsic vector. Now we can define an exit function or an extrinsic function. And we're just going to define what it is. And uh, calculating these extrinsic functions is a little bit more complicated. We're not going to do this. We're just providing the results. So an extrinsic function depends on some code. So we have a code nk. And we choose the code with x with some probability p of x, where usually p of x is 2 to the power minus k. So every code word is chosen with the same probability. And then we transmit this code word over a channel. So we receive a vector y. Now, the exit function, which is called ij, is the mutual information between the bit at position j, xj, and the vector yj tilde. So it's the information that is transferred from one bit to the other bits in the code word vector, except the bit at position j. So the information between one bit at position j and the received vector excluding the position j. Okay, so what is this? This is, um, we insert the definition of the mutual information. This is the entropy of bit xj minus the conditional entropy of bit xj given the received vector y tilde j, so excluding yj. And this we can do for every position in the code word. And then we can take the average over all positions. So then the average exit function, this is what we are interested in, is just the average over the j different individual exit functions. Okay. So this is an, an exit function. We can calculate these exit functions for a couple of codes. Um, in the case of LDPC codes, um, we are interested in single parity check codes and repetition codes. Because we saw that an LDPC code essentially is made up of a repetition code and a single parity check code. So that is the ones that we are interested in. So let's quickly adjust something. Okay, so we start with the parity check code. So we have a single parity check code of length n with n minus 1 information bits. And we start with the binary erasure channel with probability C. This is the channel we are interested in. And we assume that the check node sits there and the input bits are erased with probability C, the input of the decoder essentially. We know that the mutual information of this channel is 1 minus xi. We have a channel with erasure probability xi. And this as a mutual information of this channel is 1 minus xi. And we denote this mutual information by IA. This is the input to the decoder. That's a so-called a priori mutual information. So we have erasure probability xi channel that is erased with probability C has a mutual information of 1 minus C. So now we can calculate this exit function and we'll just give the result. The result is that IE is 1 minus C tilde of C. And this is 1 minus C to the power n minus 1. So n is the length n minus 1 is the number of information bits of the check node. So 1 minus c is the mutual information of the channel, this so-called a priori mutual information. So this is ia to the power n minus 1. So we have finally ie, the single parity check code, is equal to i. A, the a priori mutual information to the power n minus 1. Okay, very well. So we have the first component already. 
Now we're looking at the repetition code. So again, we're looking at a repetition code of length n. And um, we can calculate essentially the um, extrinsic exit function. And the exit function for the repetition code is 1 minus xi to the power n minus 1. And this is, again, we know that xi would be the uh, input uh, mutual information. So this is 1 minus ia to the power n minus 1. So uh, now we can put everything together. So um, we know that in the case of an LEPC code, we have a variation because the bits are not transmitted over the same channel. We have one bit that is coming from the communication channel, the actual channel, and we have n minus one bits of the repetition code that are coming from the graph. So they are erased with some probability C. And one is erased with probability epsilon. So and in this case, we have the following, which is relevant for our analysis. The exit function of this variant is 1 minus epsilon c to the power n minus 2, which is 1 minus epsilon times 1 minus ia to the power n minus 2. Okay, so now we put everything together. So we know the LPC code of a regular code consists of check nodes of degree dc, which are single parity check codes of length dc. The variable nodes are repetition codes of length dv plus 1. One bit is transmitted over the channel, and the other dv bits, they are transmitted over the graph, which is essentially a binary erasure channel with erasure probability xi. So this is uh, summarizing what we have. We have a variable node. The variable node essentially has one bit connected to the channel erase with probability epsilon, and dv bits erase with probability c. And we say that c is equal to 1 minus the a priori mutual information, 1 minus ia. So we have the exit function is 1 minus epsilon times 1 minus the mutual information to the power dv minus 1. The same thing happens on the parity check, the check node side. We have the check node, which is a parity check code, single parity check code. We have DC inputs of um, erasure probability C or mutual information 1 minus C. And the exit function is 1 is IA to the power DC minus 1. So now we have expressed everything in terms of mutual information. For the binary erasure channel, there is a very simple relationship between um, erasure and mutual information. But now we have everything expressed in terms of mutual information. So now um, what we can do is we can draw an exit chart of an LDPC code. Very similar to this chart that we drew before. But now we draw everything in terms of mutual information. So what we have is the following situation. We draw a chart and we have on the x-axis i, a, or v, and on the y-axis we have i, e, v. And we draw the behavior of the variable node function. So we have a curve that looks like this. So this is and let me draw this curve in yellow, or highlight it in yellow. So this is IEV as a function of IAV. That's essentially the behavior of the variable node, which is a function of epsilon. So now we draw also the curve of the check node. And we know that the output of the variable node becomes the input of the check node. So IEV is equal to i a c. So the output of the variable node decoder becomes the input to the check node because it is over the graph it is fed to the check nodes. So the a priori mutual information for the 
tech node sits on the y axis. And the output sits on the x axis. Because the output of the check node is going to be the input of the variable node. So therefore, we have an equality here. So now we can draw this curve with the swapped axes and we get something that may look like this. So this is IEC as a function of IAC, behavior of the check nodes, which we draw with swapped axes. So now we can determine the decoding behavior. Now we start at the origin, at zero, zero, because we have zero information at the beginning. The mutual information we have at the beginning is zero. Then we go to the variable node and we get some mutual information from the variable node. Then we go to the check node. Then we go again to the variable node. We go to the check node, variable node, check node, and so on. So the coding gets successful if we reach this point, which is the point of highest mutual information means that we have perfect information about the bits in our code. The coding is successful if we can reach the point one, one. Okay, so here is the visualization. Essentially, it's more or less the same chart, just everything is flipped. That's because the mutual information is one minus the erasure probability. So no big surprises here. And we can also plot and show the uh, decoding behavior using the staircase function. And we see that here IAV is equal to IEC and IAC is equal to IEV. Because the output of the variable node becomes the input of the check node and vice versa. So this is the um, exit chart and that's a um, very, very important tool that we're going to use later designing LDPC codes. Okay, so we can start with a few properties of LDPC codes and exit charts. So we start with the area underneath this uh, exit functions, and we start with the check node. So we have a check node of degree DC is parity check code of rate DC minus one divided by DC. So now we just calculate the area underneath the exit function. So the area underneath the check node function and the check the area underneath the check node function is this area. Recall that we plotted with swapped axes. So it's this area that we that we determine. So because here we have the x axis and here we have the y axis of this function. So we calculate this, it's the integral from 0 to 1 of C of IA and uh, we insert C of IA is IA to the power DC minus 1, that's a fairly simple integral, that's IA to the power DC divided by DC and uh, from 0 to 1, this is 1 over DC essentially, which is equal to 1 minus DC minus 1 over DC, which is equal to 1 minus the rate of the parity check code. So the area underneath the function is completely characterized by the check node degree. That's also the only variable it depends on. So that's quite natural. And uh, now we do the same for the variable node exit function. So now the variable node exit function, now we calculate the area underneath. And the area underneath is this area. Now. Here we don't have swapped axes, so we calculate this area. So that's what we do. So uh, again, the integral is fairly simple. So this is 1 minus epsilon, integral from 0 to 1 of tau to the power dv minus 1 d tau. This is 1 minus epsilon divided by dv. So again, it's depending on two parameters, epsilon and dv, and it's characterized by those two parameters. And we see also the curve changes when we change epsilon, so it's natural that the area also changes if we change epsilon. So here is a visualization. 
we have the variable node function. This is the area for the tree six code. It's one minus epsilon over dv. And um, we can insert the values of epsilon and dv. And we have the check node as the function. That's the area underneath this one. So now why did we do this? Um, what can we say about this? Well, we can say the following. So we can, instead of looking at this area, we can look at this area. The area of this box is equal to one. So this whole box has an area of one. So if we calculate this area, this is one minus the gray area. So this area is one minus the in gray area. And this is 1 minus 1 over dc. Now we know that in order to decode, this curve must be strictly above the check node curve. So this curve must be somewhere here. That's a condition, necessary and sufficient decode condition for being able to decode. But that also means that this area underneath the violet curve must be larger than the other. Otherwise, we cannot decode. That's a necessary condition for decoding. So we can formalize this. So the area of this curve must be large, or the area underneath this curve must be larger than this area. Otherwise, we cannot decode because otherwise it's impossible that the curve lies strictly above the other curve. So we can formulate this as a theorem. So a necessary worth to mention it's not a sufficient condition it would still be that we have a curve that looks somehow like this it will have a larger area because this one will be larger than the area underneath but um, we will not be able to decode in this case so it's necessary but it's not sufficient condition so uh, this condition is the following um, um, so a necessary but not sufficient condition is that the area underneath the variable node curve is strictly larger than one minus the area above the check node curve or above the check node exit check node function or the below the inverse check node exit function and this is a condition that is necessary for decoding. So this condition is uh, very uh, important because it allows an easy check if a certain parameterization uh, can be decoded. And this doesn't hold exactly for the binary erasure channel. This will also hold for general channels, which we're going to see later. So if we plug in the exit functions that we have just calculated for the binary erasure channel, then we can massage the expression a little bit and we get the following um, condition. We get the condition that epsilon must be smaller than dv over dc, which is one minus the design rate of the code. Okay, this is not surprising because this is the channel capacity. So we cannot decode if we are above capacity. We cannot surpass capacity. So the uh, erasure curve or the rate must be smaller than the capacity of the channel. So this is equivalent to saying that the design rate epsilon, must, um, sorry, the design rate is RD. The design rate RD must be smaller than one minus epsilon, which is the capacity of the channel. This is not very surprising. It means we cannot surpass capacity, but it's also a good, um, it's also good news because it means that if we have a curve that matches exactly, we'll be able to reach capacity. So we could, in principle, go up to capacity. There is no fundamental bound that limits us but towards capacity. So this is reassuring because it tells us, okay, um, possibly we can reach capacity. It's not clear how yet because we saw that with regular codes we cannot, but from the condition, um, it doesn't. there's nothing that prevents us to do so. Okay, so with this, we have reached the end of the exit chart.
chapter. And in the next chapter, we're going to look at a class of codes that allow us to get closer to capacity, which is a class of irregular LEPC codes.